Hi, this is Kelsey Fakowski for AP Gov Review, and this is the first installment of Unit 6, which is going to be looking at civil liberties and public policy. This is the final unit of AP Gov. So it's first important to establish what civil liberties are. When we look at civil liberties, we're talking about the legal constitutional protections against the government, and that you would find in the Bill of Rights. So for example, freedom of speech is a civil liberty. The right that the police cannot just knock down your door without a warrant under the Fourth Amendment is another example of a civil liberty. In contrast, a civil right are, includes actions that the government takes to create equal conditions for all people. So the law is not being applied equally. So civil liberties are for everybody, theoretically, and civil rights are more practical. Um, so those are two very, very important distinctions that you're going to need to know. Again, please make sure that you definitely know that civil liberties are the legal constitutional protections against the government. And then whereas civil liberty rights, you're seeing actions that the government takes, such as passing the Civil Rights Act, to create equal conditions for all people. Now, of course, as you know from Unit 1 and your study of American history, that the Bill of Rights is composed of the first 10 amendments which protect basic liberties, such as religion and speech, as seen in the First Amendment. Now, if you look at this chart uh, in front of you, you have the first 10 amendments, very important protections that were set to ease the fears of the anti-federalists that the new constitution would allow for a monarch potentially to come about, but the anti-federalist uh, fears are somewhat mitigated by the addition of the Bill of Rights, which of course allows for the ratification of the Constitution. So the Bill of Rights uh, and the states, when it was written, it was written to restrict the powers of the national government, not the state governments. So keep this in mind that when you have the Bill of Rights, just because you have the freedom of speech means you can't be persecuted by the federal government, not necessarily the state government. So a very famous Supreme Court case, which I would be aware of in uh, 1833, is Baron v. Baltimore, which states that the Bill of Rights uh, pertains to the national government, not the states. And it assumed that the states would automatically protect these rights because when the Constitution was designed, right, it was to protect the states, as seen in the Articles of Confederation, which were then strapped. And then when you saw what the, the uh, devisement of the Bill of Rights, you have the Tenth Amendment, which is supposed to protect the states as well. And so as a result, it was this assumption that led to the outcome of Baron v. Baltimore. Again, the Bill of Rights pertains to the national government, not the states. So we'll have what's called selective incorporation. I'll get to that in just a second. But we have another Supreme Court case, fast forward about another 100 years, called Gitlow v. New York. And this is when the Supreme Court rules that freedom of speech and press, only two parts of the First Amendment, not the entire First Amendment, were fundamental personal rights and liberties in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment historically has been known as the Equality Amendment because it says you have to apply the law equally. It can't apply to some people one way and you can't just apply the uh, one right a different way for another group of people. So that's really where you get the 14th Amendment becoming the Equality Amendment. So even though this is a First Amendment case, it's settled upon 14th Amendment grounds. And this is the first case of what is a very, very important concept, really, of Unit 6, is selective incorporation. This is the legal concept of the Supreme Court nationalizing the Bill of Rights, making most of its provisions applicable to the states. So really what's going to happen is notice the word selective, right? You're going to be picking parts of each amendment, which are going to say, yes, all 50 states, you have to abide by this. So most amendments, one by one, are going to be incorporated, and ultimately this is going to restrict the state and local governments one by one. So freedoms of speech and press, as of 1925, now pertain to the state. So you couldn't be persecuted for that if a state did not have that law already on the book. So again, with selective incorporation, you're making this now the Bill of Rights nationalized for a specific part of an amendment for all 50 states that all of them have to abide by. So of course, um, over time, as you see in 1925, dealing with the First Amendment and freedom of speech, dealing with Gitlow v. New York, these are all cases of the nationalization of the Bill of Rights or selective incorporation.
So this has been a phenomenon that has occurred since 1925. And you see, even as of 2008, the right to bear arms was nationalized. Uh, most states already even had it on the book uh, through the District of Columbia v. Heller. So again, a lot of cases involving selective incorporation, very, very important. So let's move on to the freedom of religion and the Establishment Clause, very important part of the First Amendment dealing with religion, which it states, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Well, what does this mean? Does this mean that the government cannot favor one religion over another? Or from Jefferson's point of view, uh, that there should be a wall of separation. And I purposely bolded that word because you might see that particular phrase. The wall of separation would be between church and state, and it would forbid favoritism and support for religion entirely. It would be completely separated, completely divorced from politics and from just ordinary society dealing with governmental matters. So these are two competing views as to what does the Establishment Clause mean. Now, with Lemon v. Kurtzman in 1971, the Supreme Court is going to make a landmark ruling that states that aid to church-related schools, such as parochial schools, must meet all three parts according to the Lemon test. And this was thrown out of the Establishment Clause. So, for example, this case really had to do with busing. Can you have public dollars being used to bus people, bus students, to a secular school? Well, it establishes the lemon test, hence for the plaintiff here. A, or number one, it has to have a secular legislative purpose. In this case, well, it's the, the secular, secular purpose is to bus kids to school for educated-related educated matters. Number two, have a primary effect that neither advances or inhibits religion. Well, all you're doing is you're transporting them to school to learn. And then number three, not foster an excessive governmental uh, entanglement with religion. Not really if you're just busing kids to school. You're not handing out Bibles. You're not handing out crosses or anything like that. So as a result of this case, you have what's called the lemon test. And it has to meet all three prongs for uh, this to be held up. Um, if it misses one, then it violates the Establishment Clause and hence would be declared unconstitutional. So this is going to allow for aid to go to church-related schools, and that's why you have busing to private schools today, even though it's through public dollars. Dealing with the Establishment Clause as well, in Engel v. Vitell in 1962, Voluntary resuscitations of prayer or Bibles when done as part of a classroom exercise in public school. Well, if you were to apply the lemon test, well, it's going to be declared unconstitutional. Uh, it's constitutional, though, still for today, for students to pray silently as they wish. But based on this lemon test here, does it really have a secular legislative purpose? Does this perhaps advance religion? Arguably, yes. And could this indeed have an entanglement with religion? Again, that's what you're going to see as a violation of the lemon test. So it has been applied uh, before here with the uh, lemon test. So ultimately, with the Establishment Clause, the Supreme Court has ruled that the sponsorship or encouragement of prayer directly or even indirectly by public school authorities is, again, in unconstitutional. Since the 1990s, fundamentalists uh, have... Uh, called for a constitutional amendment for prayer in school. Of course, that has not passed. Otherwise, you'd probably be aware of it. And the majority of public actually still support school prayer, even though it is not legal. And schools, um, even in the Bible Belt region of the United States, interestingly enough, uh, still do defy the court's ruling. And as you know, the Supreme Court does not have the power of the sword, so it's very difficult to really implement all their uh, cases. Now, also dealing with freedom of religion is the Free Exercise Clause, which states Congress shall make no law respecting or establishment of religion, that's the Establishment Clause, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, meaning that this prohibits the government from interfering with one's practice of religion. So some religious practices may conflict with other rights and then be denied or punished. In the court case of Employment Division v. Smith, the court ruled that state laws interfering with religious practices but not aimed at one particular uh, religion are constitutional. So take for example that uh, Oregon is allowed to prosecute Native Americans who use peyote as part of their ritual. So by having that illegal, it wasn't necessarily directed at towards Native American religions. This was something that was for the general populace. So as a result, that was upheld. 
So again, a good example is too, murder is illegal. It's not uh, aimed toward any religion, but if a religion had murder as part of its ritual, you could not claim the free exercise clause there because again, that is something that is not aimed at one particular religion, it is a universal type of law that murder is bad. So as a result, that would not fall under the free exercise clause. Other limitations include Reynolds v. United States, and this is as of 1878. This ruled that religious duty is not a defense for a crime. And in this case, it uh, upheld that laws against bigamy and polygamy were illegal. So if you're familiar with some of these shows of my five wives or sister wives, um, technically bigamy and polygamy are illegal. Um, and what you see on those television shows is violating this Supreme Court case. Um, but again, at the end of the day, you still have that ruling that religious duty is not a defense for a crime. You can't say, oh, God told me to murder this person. You cannot use that. Again, that does not fall under the free exercise clause. But at the same time, there are religious practices that are okay. So, for example, being a conscientious war objector, such as Muhammad Ali, with respect to the Vietnam War, that is okay should you show a history of that that is actually part of your beliefs. That is okay. That is part of the free exercise clause. Another good example is Amish parents take their students out after eighth grade. The court has ruled that it is a well-established religious precedence and that overtook compulsory education laws. So you see that there are some good examples of that. So let's end with a review question. Gitlow v. New York is a U.S. Supreme Court case that dealt with which of the following amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Take a moment to think it over. And if you said the First Amendment, you are indeed correct. And really, for an added bonus, can you think of the term that goes along with Gitlow v. New York? And if you are thinking selective incorporation, you are correct, where the Bill of Rights is being nationalized to all 50 states, case by case, amendment by amendment.